apologize. But thanks for being here for this session, the last of the day. I know you've had a very long day, so our panel is agreed. We're going to keep our comments uh, very much to the point. Welcome. My name is Jackie Maloney. I'm the Chancellor of UMass Lowell. I'm going to take a two second just to give you, of course, I have to do a promo of UMass Lowell, right? And I'm sure you may have heard UMass Lowell has been going through quite a transformation. We are the ninth fastest growing university in the country and the second fastest rising in the U.S. News and World Report. This transformation has been uh, come about in large part because of our topic today. It's the way that we have worked innovatively with business and industry. One of the hallmarks of a UMass Lowell education is experiential applied learning. We have thousands of opportunities for our students to engage from the day they enter the university to the time that they graduate. Many of those are grounded in experiential opportunities that were developed in coordination with business and industry. That's why this year when our students graduated and perhaps why we're so fast growing, 90, over 90% 90 of our students had great job placement rate, uh, job placement, our graduation placement. Over 90% of our students successful. Again, because of the deep experience. So that's something our panel is going to be talking about. I'm really pleased and honored to be with this great panel. Julian El Cid, from the chief, who is the Chief Workforce Strategist at College for America at Southern New Hampshire University. Kelly Villieres is the President and CEO of Sound Manufacturing and Steve Barnack, the Senior Vice President for Business Higher Education for, uh, Forum. We'll be discussing today looking at how to get started in forming a partnership with business and industry. What are the, some of the new models and innovative approaches that you might consider in building partnerships with your college or university? We'll be talking about how to sustain those partnerships, what are the benefits, and we're going to start off with introductions from my colleagues. They'll give a brief overview of the work that they're doing at each of their institutions. And then I'll follow up with a set of questions. Again, we're hoping to keep that part of the program to about a half an hour so we could have the last half hour be more interactive and get you to ask the questions that you're most interested in hearing about. But before we do that, I was hoping I mean, I thought we could do jumping jacks to get the <laughs> air going, but maybe just a little hand raising. How many of you currently have partnerships with business and industry? Those of you at colleges. So many of you already have those. On a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being the most extraordinary, deep, great partnerships, how many of you would say those partnerships are on a scale of 1 to 3? Weak you know, just started. How many are in that 5 to 10? Looks like a lot of you have very deep partnerships. How many in the middle ground? But let's just keep it middle. So you're ending up about third, third, and third. <coughs> so we know this is an area we, that is ripe for growth. How many of you are from business and industry? A couple of you. So you'll have some good feedback as we go forward. Great. Well, I'm going to ask uh, Steve to start off with his introduction and overview, and I'm going to now go over and join the panel now that I have your attention. Thank you for joining us. Thank you, Jack. Uh, I'm Steve Barkanik. I'm Senior Vice President and Chief Program Officer at the Business Higher Education Forum. I want to congratulate you for making it this far in the conference, um, and thank you for being here, and thanks to the New England Higher Education Board for uh, hosting this. Um, just to give you a little a background about myself, I've been in the philanthropic side of the equation for most of my career. I've been with BHEF for five years. Prior to that, I was uh, with the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, uh, and before that, I was with something called the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, and I was there when it got started off the ground in the late 80s. So it's a you know it's very interesting to be back on this side of the uh, the table, but uh, in terms of fundraising, but I think it's been an extraordinary opportunity for us to find new ways to partner with uh, business and higher education. I think it's helpful to give you a sense of what BHEF is about. We're a national independent 501c3 organization. We've been around for about 40 years. 
And uh, our members are some of the country's leading, most passionate uh, thinkers in terms of uh, how business and higher education form partnerships. Uh, they include CEOs and senior executives of some of the nation's leading uh, corporations and presidents of colleges, universities, and uh, university systems, both public and private. So uh, the way we work is primarily to engage with our members, uh, but that's not to say we don't engage with non-member uh, institutions. And uh, we launched five years ago something called the Higher Education and Workforce Initiative. And it uh, brought together a few strands of work that we had been doing prior to that in terms of college readiness and success and STEM education, but looking beyond STEM to fields that are emerging where a business is feeling it's not getting the kinds of graduates with the kinds of skills and mindsets that it needs to succeed uh, in a highly competitive global environment. So the way we uh, developed this program initially was in uh, cybersecurity uh, that's been mentioned a few times today. And I'm going to just take this opportunity to introduce my colleague, Debbie Hughes, uh, from BHEF. Uh, and if you have any difficult questions, please feel free to direct them to Debbie. Um, um, so uh, this really began with a, a partnership between uh, Northrop Grumman uh, and our, their CEO, Wes Bush, and the head of the University of Maryland system, uh, Brett Kerwin, to create a new uh, undergraduate pathway in cybersecurity at the University of Maryland. Uh, Northrop Grumman put up uh, $1.1 million to create a living learning environment, an academic community for students starting in their first year. So uh, I think one of the key tenets of this higher education workforce initiative is that most of our higher education and business members were not satisfied with the kinds of partners uh, they were partnerships that they were developing and I was pleased to see that most of you feel that uh, your partnerships are at least adequate if not strong but our members felt much more could be done, particularly in emerging fields where uh, academia could really use the input from business and also in terms of creating a more diverse uh, environment for student uh, success. So uh, what we did in uh, College Park was to create this 24-7 living learning community, which really moved Northrop Grumman, which had just moved its headquarters from California to the Washington, D.C. area of Virginia, um, to move from a more what we call a transactional relationship in terms of how business engages with higher ed to a much more strategic one focused on talent development. So Northrop Grumman invested in this living learning community. Uh, they co-developed the curriculum for this uh, uh, pathway and involved six courses in a sequence from um, first and second year. Uh, and, and students from any academic background could join this community. And it turned, about, turned out to be wildly successful. They were expecting a, an opening class of 25 students, which is the norm for this kind of uh, uh, honors college. And they've got about 50 students in their first year. Now they're uh, getting uh, I think 160 was in their last uh, incoming class. They cannot control for uh, enrollment, so they have to take the number of students they get. And Northrop Grumman then came in with another $3 million grant to sustain this and to move it to a four-year program. But this beca began a sort of a, a process for BHEF to think about how we engage business and higher education in a very intentional process. Um, and so we have a series of steps. Uh, we, like, we sometimes call it the 12-step program, but it's really eight. Uh, and we begin with a regional workforce analysis to understand where are the emerging needs and where are the gaps. Um, we also conduct with business involvement, uh, a candidate profile. What is the What are the skills and uh, uh, backgrounds of the ideal candidate? We map uh, we map these competencies, uh, much like the Department of Labor does. Um, we develop um, a credential. We identify a credential. We find that the academic minor is indeed one of the more effective kinds of uh, credentials uh, for this um, uh, kind of pathway. We integrate high impact practices. Uh, we've talked a lot about applied learning experiences. That's a key one, but mentoring, advising, uh, capstone experiences, uh, a host of uh, uh, experiences that, that increase student persistence and success. Uh, we develop f uh, feedback loops on curriculum and courses. They're always being improved. There's constant engagement by Northrop Grumman engineers with University of Maryland faculty members, uh, or in general, with uh, between the business and higher education uh, in, uh, 
participants. And then we roll out the program with in continued engagement uh, and continued uh, uh, development. And I want to focus on two of these models um, that we developed uh, beyond Maryland. One uh, that Debbie is leading in St. Louis is part of a five-site uh, grant that we uh, received from um, the National Science Foundation focusing on STEM student success. Primarily, what is the role business can uniquely play in increasing the persistence of students from two to four year STEM programs? Uh, we find that the first two years of, of college, whether it's in a, a community college or a four year program, are some of the most vulnerable areas for which students drop out. And what can business do to increase the career relevance of that experience, of that particular uh, age of student? And how can uh, business sustain that through the four years, that engagement? So um, one of the five sites is in St. Louis. And our, we have two members there, Boeing, which has a major defense uh, uh, presence in St. Louis, and the Washington University of St. Louis, which is, as you know, uh, a major private research institution that doesn't really well, I, I have to be careful here, but they're not as engaged regionally as many of you are in your communities. Students come from other places to go to Washington University, and they go away somewhere else. So what is the impact of Washington University in terms of increasing the talent pool in its region? And they are very sensitive to that. So we help uh, WashU and Boeing um, partner with um, uh, the Florissant Valley Community College in Ferguson, Missouri, which is one of the most chronically underemployed uh, parts of the country, um, and the University of Missouri, St. Louis, to create a pull-through pathway in which Boeing engineers get involved from the very first year students begin at Florissant Valley. And this is really mobilizes already existing partnerships that Boeing has with Florissant Valley, and then with the University of Missouri St. Louis. But every step of the way, Boeing engineers are involved in advising, providing uh, advice on scholarship uh, opportunities, providing internships, co-developing curricula. And the students, by the time they come out of this program, uh, and they are beginning to come out of the program now, uh, that it's been around for about uh, three years, um, are um, they get a degree from both UMSL, University of Missouri, St. Louis, and Washington University. And what is very interesting about this particular initiative is that it's beginning to change the hiring practices of Boeing. Uh, Boeing, as many as uh, many major companies, uh, select maybe 50 to 100 of the leading uh, institutions in the country to, from which to select their, uh, to recruit. Uh, but now they're realizing they can grow their own talent in their own backyard. And it's beginning to shape their human resources strategy. Um, the other model that I wanted to uh, point out to you was uh, one that we uh, uh, are engaged now in New York City. It's a New York City data science task force. And we received funding from the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation to involve maybe five or six of the leading academic institutions, including the CUNY system, which involves all of the community colleges in, in New York City, as well as many of their, well, all of their four-year public institutions. New York University, Barnard College, liberal arts institutions, it's a real cross-section with employers. So we have an interesting cross-section of high-tech employers like Google. We have the Museum of Modern Art involved in this, the Governor's Office of New York, um, uh, companies in the financial services sector, to get together to map the competencies they feel are needed for what we call the data science-enabled graduate. These are the kinds of students that business is telling us they really need for a variety of roles in their companies. So um, this is a different kind of model than the, the, the other two that I mentioned because it involves groups of institutions and it's imminently more scalable. Uh, and it's sort of forming a consortium. And it's going to end up with three pathways that uh, we'll be seeding at three of these institutions in which the business side partners to create new undergraduate pathways uh, at New York City institutions. So I think I'm going to pause there, Jacqueline, and, and move on. Well, thank you for that. Kelly? Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Um, I have the pleasure of wearing three hats, actually four sometimes. So uh, my first hat is I took over the family business in manufacturing. So I'm the CEO and president of a precision sheet metal contract manufacturer in Old Saybrook, Connecticut. And people ask me, how the heck did you get there? Because my other hat is in adult experiential learning. And people say, well, how does that help you with running a manufacturing company? 
And I say, can't run a manufacturing company if I didn't have the background in adult experiential learning. And the fun part about it when I first started is we all talked very different language. They talked about bombs, which I learned later on was a bill of material, not an actual bomb, <laughs> which took me a while to learn. And I was talking about self-regulation and metacognition, and they were looking at me like I had three heads. Um, but now we all speak the same language, which is that of an effective workforce and what we need in order for our employees to be productive members of our community and help us grow our organization and give back to the community. And in my endeavors on kind of figuring out how do I marry these two together, I had the great pleasure of joining an organization called the Eastern Advanced Manufacturing Alliance. And the founder of that alliance, Ray Coombs, um, was a very for, uh, foresightful person and looked at the fact that in order for manufacturers to get what we need, which is a skilled workforce, that we needed to be involved in the educational programs that uh, turned out the employees that we were going to hire. And so over the course of 10 years, he worked with uh, Quinnebog Valley Community College and we expanded the program to Three Rivers Community College. And I took on the presidency of that organization last year just because I needed another hat to wear um, <laughs> when it got cold, right? So um, it, I found that it's, it's very interesting because we've now been able to create what we call an ecosystem that supports the workforce needs in Eastern Connecticut. And because Electric Boat is in our backyard and they're the 10,000 pound gorilla in the room, um, we get recognized and we've gotten a lot of uh, national attention around the ecosystem that we've created because it's not just electric boat, but it's the supply chain that goes all the way down. And it's now not just electric boat, but it's Pratt & Whitney and Sikorsky. So in Connecticut in manufacturing, we have, I think it's almost 1,500 jobs a year over the next 15 years that we need to fill and we need to have qualified people to fill these jobs. And when we talk about manufacturing, we don't talk about just the button pushers, we talk about the people who will run these manufacturing companies and divisions over time. So I'm looking forward to having a conversation with you about how we go about doing that. Thank, thank you very much, Kelly. Okay, and Julian? Great, okay. Well, good afternoon, everyone. And what, so what's the standard joke I'm supposed to say? Like I'm the, what's standing between you and a cocktail or something, right? <laughs> um, so I'm Julian Alcid and it's a pleasure to be here and I'm glad, I am very glad you've all st stuck this out and, and thanks to New England Board of Higher Ed for including me. So teeny bit about background, I, I spent, um, I'd founded and for 13 years ran a consulting think tank called Workforce Strategy Center that did work in, I think, 23 states with scores of regions. We were really focused on how can we make education more responsive to the economy. And I was, um, and, and I was sort of forever frustrated on, on a couple of fronts. One, by the fact that it was so hard to get employers and education to kind of speak the same language. It was a lot of this. Um, and which makes sense because they're completely different and they serve different purposes and they speak different languages was what they were brought up to do. And it was also frustrating because even when they came together, so often the result were little boutique initiatives, even after much ado. And so I came to believe more and more that competencies really offer a key to getting everyone on the same page. Employers get competencies, they can you know, use competencies uh, in job descriptions. And on the education side, we can use competencies to inform and shape program. And so flash forward to just over three years ago, I connected with um, the leadership at Southern New Hampshire University, my current employer, um, which was just getting off the ground a new college, um, which we've modestly called College for America. Um, and the idea is um, it, of College for America is it's a, it's a competency-based model, and it's a college for working adults. And so, I, so needless to say, I ended up getting so excited, I um, merged the consulting think tank in with SNHU to help build and grow College for America. Um, I'm very happy to say we just celebrated our third third birthday and um, this this month just a few days ago and so what distinguishes us from the rest of our institution is we as I, uh, uh, we, we are, are, are all about competencies our students um, 
uh, are, 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 are the models competency based and students undertake projects, it's all online, um, and baked into these projects are the competencies that are in demand in key industries and occupations, along with all the other competencies that need to be mastered as part of an academic program. We're a, a private nonprofit liberal arts college. And, and the idea is that our students advance um, as soon as they've mastered, say, the 120 competencies in their associate's degree program, they'll earn their credential, whether it takes them six months or two years. There are no grades. Students either master the competencies or not yet. The, we, we do this, um, this is a business-to-business -business model, so we're actually partnering with employers that are both looking to upgrade their workers' skills and, um, and also address business challenges around retention and advancement and succession planning and engagement and all sorts of other workforce-y things. Um, my shop is responsible for understanding the competencies, not unlike what you were describing, Steve, of sort of understanding a researching and understanding competencies that are in demand. Because we're online, our scope is national. Um, and, um, and then working and then bringing together our curriculum design team with subject matter experts and, and, and um, exemplar supervisors or people doing the actual jobs to build the projects that comprise the program. And we, as I said, we're just finished our third year. Last year we had 5,000 students enrolled. We currently have 120 partners ranging from Anthem, uh, you know, Blue Cross, Blue Shields around the country to several of the country's major health and hospital, um, healthcare and hospital systems partners as a partner's healthcare as a partner. Um, and um, and we've and we've graduated over 700 students. So I'm happy to provide all sorts of other data and information. We're a very very different kind of animal, but I do think that um, even with, within our institution and in higher ed in general, but I think that a lot of the lessons learned and a lot of the sort of things we're doing have all sorts of implications for for colleges and universities that are looking to do this both online and place based. That's great. And congratulations to each of you on your success and. You know, it was just interesting to hear the word boutique programs, and I think Steve talked a lot about scaling up, and Kelly looking at a whole ecosystem that you've created in East Connecticut. So I think let's start with the scale-up question, I and mean, we can come back to what are the qualities, but how do you scale up these programs? Because I think we all know doing one-offs with business and industry for a college or university can be very labor intensive. There's a lot of negotiation that goes into each of these contracts. So how do you get at this scale issue? Sure. I, I can take that to start off with. Um, so for Eastern Connecticut, it really came down to our manufacturing alliance. So we have 54 different manufacturing companies in a similar geographic area. and that becomes the voice of what the industries in this area need and inform the educational partners that we have. So not only do we work with the community colleges, and, and it started there, so we came to the colleges and said, listen, here are some programs that we need, and not just we as in a couple manufacturers, but a collective large group of manufacturers that represented even other organizations that don't have the foresight to join our organization yet. Um, so with that came a lot of negotiation uh, back and forth with the community colleges. And then we were able to bring in the Workforce Investment Board who um, looked at and had all the data on people who were unemployed or underemployed and what pathways would be good for these people and then creating those pathways through the community colleges um, we also have created a, a short-term pathway um, to get them some credentials without credit. But the, the nice thing that we've done is the programs at the community colleges are for credit. And they're certificate programs, but they roll into another part of our ecosystem is um, the state has developed a, a degree called the College of Technology. And what that does is allows all the community colleges to have a foundational associate's degree program that the specific technologies that are taught at the community colleges can be plugged in as the electoral credits and then create the pathway to the associate's degree and to the bachelor degree. 
So um, it's really been working with industry to inform the school systems, and the systems have been very receptive because we bring with that us students and um, the ability to generate uh, really effective programs that we hire out of, and I believe the placement rate is almost 100%. That's fantastic. So working with those networks with, that existed already and kind of taking advantage of some working groups. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, I know that's, and I, I definitely think working with the networks is 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 key. Couple of thoughts about scale. What one is, you know, coming back to the whole competency notion. I do think that um, some very interesting things emerge when you begin to look um, at at kind of work in terms of competencies. And there are many who believe that as as jobs change more and more and become more sort of technology driven, that. Um, you know, what have we but our competencies to take with us to the next experience. And so in many ways, one one way to think about scale, industry specific is obviously key because you can work with groups of employers and understand their, their needs. I also think that when you begin to look at skills and the types of skills that cut across different jobs, that's also really key. So as an example, our associates, um, we have uh, five different programs. One is a associates in general studies with concentration in business. It has, it's very calibrated it's in many ways to, to work for people who are in sort of customer service type positions and and we're just and we're seeing that that's it's having great great pickup and so we we're, we we're, we're actually able because of the way we can see how students attain competencies in advance in the programs we can also speak with their employers and with the students to see how they're kind of advancing in their work and their careers and education. And we're actually seeing correlation between improved, communi you know, the communication skills in the program and improved application of the skills in the workplace, both written and oral, as well as soft skills like teamwork and problem solving and leadership. And it's all because of the way we kind of slice and dice it. That's, that's great. And I know at Business Education Forum, Higher Education Forum, You've been doing, in fact, UMass has been involved in some of the cybersecurity work and benefited greatly from the way that you approach this. It's kind of a systems engineering, if you will. Yeah. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Steve. And that was one of the three strategies for scaling that I was going to mention, Jacqueline, that, that um, it really helps within our membership to have some university systems represented. Uh, California State System that had Tim White as a member, um, the head of the University of Wisconsin System as a member, head of CUNY as a member, Maryland. And if you can f engage through the system, now sometimes systems can have a kind of a, they have all the power and none of the power at the same time, and they can plug you in. But if you've got a, a strong, someone like J.B. Milliken at, at CUNY, um, then you can make things happen within that entire system. So to have a system strategy going forward, uh, which we have done in, in several cases, uh, can be a really powerful mechanism for scaling. Another, I, and I like uh, Kelly's uh, comment on ecosystems. Um, there, the, you can develop regional and statewide scaling strategies. Uh, we either you can begin with a system in that state or a single institution in that state, but then grow that if you begin to bring in other academic institutions, other companies. So we've done that in Maryland. As I mentioned, we're doing that in uh, New York City. We're looking at Northern Virginia as a, and Northern California. So when you begin to, uh, as we do with Burning Glass, identify regional workforce needs, you can uh, then make a case regionally that, that that locale needs to work together. And the final uh, scaling strategy that we employ is, is partnering with uh, national organizations like the Business Roundtable, um, Aerospace Industries Association. We've developed formal MOUs with uh, those on the business side. On the academic side, we've worked with the likes of APLU, ACE, um, AAU, um, and they've been terrific partners as well. And so you can push through their memberships to scale and get out effective practice. Well, that's a great point, great point. And so describe for us again, I saw probably 95, percent of the people here have already established partnerships with business and industry. And again, we know when we go out to these companies, it's not always a fit, right? Not everybody's the right fit. You have to kind of develop a chemistry, I think, to really get out effective partnerships and this kind of really drilled down deep partnering. So could you describe some of your most successful partnerships what are, this, what are the characteristics that we should all look for? 
Um, sure. Yeah. So, well, let's see. I would say our um, if I our biggest partnership and probably certainly our most successful so far has been with Anthem Blue Cross. Um, we piloted in New Hampshire with 41 students. Our initial pilot really came about because the president of Anthem New Hampshire is on the board of our university, and and Paul LeBlanc, our, our um, my boss, our president, said. Hey Lisa, would you be willing to test this out? And she was, you know, which I think is a very important point. So it began with a relationship there. They were willing to give it a try. They were um, pleased with the results of the pilot. Forty-one students went through the program. Lisa, um, you know, a year later, just this past summer, I was at the White House with the chief. Um, human resource officer for Anthem, where he announced to a group of 40 CEOs, um, business executives around the country, that Anthem was going to make the program available to 50,000 eligible employees nationwide. And it was really a function of both the pilot going well, Lisa's involvement, but I think the real key was that we were helping, um, the one, one minor not minor, major piece I left out of my initial discussion. Our program is, um, by and large, the employers are paying the tuition for the program. So we're tapping tuition, um, company tuition programs. Uh, um, um, and what we're, and so 70% so of our students are graduating, 71% with uh, zero debt, and 70% um, with zero debt, 21% with $5,000 or less. And so what we're kind of selling, in a sense, in our partnerships with employers is kind of a, a way of directing tuition dollars um, to, bo to both help retain and advance employees. So Anthem really did this largely because they wanted to engage employees. They're, most of the students in our program are sitting at computers, doing customer service, alone, I don't know, wherever they are in their homes. It's pretty alienating work. And this is a way to kind of keep them engaged, uh, groom people for leadership positions. And, you know, and the, the students have loved it. And the company has as well. So, and, and the engagement, with us becomes very complicated because it involves, um, you know, reaching managers throughout a big corporation. And uh, but but the key I think really is um, having those early advocates and figuring out who in the organization do you need to really bring something to scale. Like everything we do, every partnership is pilot with an intent to scale. Right, and finding finding those willing, passionate partners who are just as yeah. passionate as you are. And I liked your comment about the alum. As I find myself. That has been very, very helpful to us to work with leaders in business and industry to help us to develop our network of, of partners. Kelly, your yeah, did you want to add anything? So, in our case, working with Electric Boat, you would think that they would come into the room and they would demand that they want everything, right? Um, but it really wasn't that way. It was really interesting to work with them through the EMA organization, which there are a lot of competitors that are in that same organization. And when we get in the same room together, we are not so much competitors as in it for the same things, right? So what we did is we looked at what are the 80% of the competencies that we all need and we kind of defined what that was and then looked at building a program that addressed those 80%. And then we said that extra 20% is really every organization's special sauce. You know, you're going to learn that in on the job. And then the Workforce Investment Boards has been really great in helping us with some of the funding to be able to do some of these programs through some uh, tax funded grants and, and other types of grants. I would second Julian's comment about the leadership side, that it is very helpful to engage whoever you see at your institution is the key leader for you, if it's the president, the system head, as your dean, provost, uh, because that, that sends an important signal to the entire system or the institution that this is a priority to engage successfully. Now, going out to business, how do you engage them? And what we found very successfully works is that uh, if you get the right folks in the room from the business side who are at least as intellectually capable in that core competency as your faculty, engage your faculty with them in a very, you know, uh, meaty way, I think that can uh, lead to these, you know, a collegial kind of relationship. It's not we're telling you what needs to be done or, you know, creating that kind of us versus them. And thinking strategically, thinking long term. This isn't a one-off, one semester little, 
you know, nice internship or co-op. You're thinking long term and you make that case to the business that we want to help you with your long term talent development needs, but we need you to do certain things with us and engage early with our students. Because if they only come in in the junior year or senior year to a career fair and they pluck off the top students and go away, um, that's really not building that kind of ecosystem that I think we need. And so to make the case to them, involve them early with students and, uh, and engage in a way that's uh, very intellectually rigorous and, and, uh, and, 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 and powerful kinds of you know, engagement. That's a great point. Okay, I think it's time that we should turn it over to you and let you ask the questions that you've been dying to hear about. <laughs> and it's such an exciting topic, right? Any questions from the audience? Yes. If you could introduce yourself, where you're from, and then sure. the question. Thank Doug you. Guy, uh, Doug Eisenhardt, I do employer. Yeah, with us, the, 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 did everyone hear the question in the back there? No. So the question is, um, with our employer partners, do the students participate, do the employers determine which program or programs the students participate in, or are they free to, free to choose? And the answer is, is, by and large, the latter. You know, we have one or two employers that have kind of narrowed the focus, or a couple of employers that are specific, specifically want folks in, say, like a healthcare program. Um, but no, it's really been uh, mostly up to the students, and it's the employers making this opportunity available. But I do think what distinguishes us from um, um, other programs is that all of our programs are really quite calibrated to to to, a, to kind of address different employer needs and I, I so so for example and the other pieces kind of I think as to what you were talking actually both of you mentioning earlier they're all very kind of stackable so for example our certificate in healthcare equals half of an associate's which equals half of a couple of bachelors and and with the associate's degree they feed into a couple of different kinds of bachelors degrees with different concentrations. So, um, so far, it, mostly the employers are just leaving it open to the students to choose. Yeah, good question. And it, it really varies according to what the sort of goal is. And I think what we find is that it's important to set the goal early. Like, what is the credential you're aiming for? Is it a, is it a concentration? Is it a minor? Is it a major? Uh, and that will determine because of all the governance issues that come into play around this, who's who from the academic side is involved. So from the business side, again, we're very fortunate to have CEOs and senior executives who can drill us down really quickly to the people within their companies uh, who can engage with us. What we try to do is steer that process and just not leave it to chance uh, or whoever is available uh, at that time and try to really make a case from the academic side, well, who is going to be most helpful for, for you from the company to help you develop whatever credential this is? And a credential is, as you know, a series of, of courses. It's a series of requirements. And in some cases, those uh, courses or requirements are already there. They might need to be repackaged some way. It might mean the torque of a one course or two. Uh, but uh, we, for example, we uh, NBC Universal came to us. They wanted to create a new uh, they didn't know what they wanted. They just knew they weren't getting the kinds of students coming out of engineering and computer engineer, electrical and computer engineering programs for the kinds of work they're doing now in terms of streaming, TV everywhere. It's a new mindset around uh, media and broadcasting. So we engage with them in an a, a institution that we help them choose, Stevens Institute of Technology in, um, in New Jersey. And we got some of the leading engineers at NBCU to come to the campus at Stevens. And we brought leading faculty and administrators from Stevens to their to 30 Rock and to Englewood Cliffs. And we began this iterative process. Now this is very, uh, this is not easy to do. And it takes a long time. And, uh, and we frankly don't, as an organization, have the bandwidth to do that constantly. But it created certain learning from us that we're writing up now. Uh, but to have that leadership at NBC Universal, and he could only come once in a while, Keith Jackson, senior vice president for their entire sort of, uh, you know, technical side. But he got us the key people who he trusted to engage with Stevens faculty. And they have a minor now. And it's, it's working. And uh, it's got all the elements. And it, it wasn't that huge a stretch for Stevens to do. I hope that answers your question. Unfortunately, I'm not familiar with that program. But it sounds like it has a lot of the components of what we're doing in Eastern Connecticut is looking at what does our area need um, for manufacturing programs. 
and not just specifically the content, but also what we call the employability skills. And I, it was very interesting that that topic came up this morning, is what is employability? Um, I was at a CEO peer group last week and we, we started talking about this and, and one of my colleagues said, you know, I, I just can't hire the right people with, that have it and I don't know what it is. And we started talking about it and really it is self-regulated lifelong learners who have the ability to think critically and think in systems, can solve problems and communicate effectively. And industry can't produce those types of people on the job. They just, they don't know what it is. They can't define it and thus they can't develop it. And even when I explained what it was and he went, yeah, that's exactly what it is. It resonated with him, but what do I do with it? How do I do that? So the programs I think that need to be developed have to balance the employability it factor with what the the content is, whether it's advanced manufacturing or healthcare or cyber space and, and things like that, is they need to balance. And I think that's where there's a really nice uh, partnership between industry and academia because academia knows what it is and they know how to develop it. And so when you get the buy-in from the organizations in your area and you can balance out those programs that address those things, I think it's, it, it adds to the level of employees that you can hire out of the programs. And uh, if, if, I, if I could, uh, because as Wayne knows, Wayne was helpful in helping us build some of our partnerships with companies like Raytheon and ha that have enabled us to in engage in these NMI grants, uh, which they're great, they're very big, they're very complicated, I'll say that. Uh, I think a lot of colleges and universities and companies are still struggling with them because of the complexity of dealing with commercialization and intellectual property. Having said that, you know, a lot of it is based in what folks have talked about already, and it really is. There's no substitute for engaging thought leaders in business and industry with our faculty. There's just no substitute. The more that we can do that, the better both sides of the house are, the better we, we strengthen each other. And we've done something at Lowell called co-location, which Wayne is very familiar with, where we actually have, for example, Raytheon has sponsored a $5 million institute, which is a research institute where their engineers are working with our faculty engineers to push out some new technology. But what's great about it, to Kelly's point, is we're creating the makers. Because all of our students are engaged in all these co-location facilities, and I think these grants will really help all, uh, this next generation of undergraduate and graduate students to work hand in glove with business and industry on these cutting edge advanced manufacturing technology. So I think it's a very, very exciting program, but it's not been without its challenges. So, Steve. No, I, and I've heard of this. I have, I've kind of lost track of it, but um, uh, I, I think several of the things you mentioned um, are key to these kinds of uh, success of these kinds of initiatives. Having a shared vision of what talent is needed for a particular sector, um, having multiple stakeholders with skin in the game involved early and often, uh, and uh, and looking for the right kinds of ways of sort of uh, portals for companies and others to participate. Because not everybody can participate at the same level. But if you give them multiple opportunities to, to engage, then I think you have a much better chance for success. Yeah. No. Just, well, just to piggyback on that, because I do, I, and I'm not familiar with that particular program. We haven't. We're not so much on the technical side, but um, the 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 process we engage in is really quite different from I think sort of your typical say DACOM process. Where, um, so for example, when we built our the certificate in healthcare fundamentals with Partners Healthcare, actually with a grant from Commonwealth Corporation, Partners received. Um, first, we we undertook some analysis using burning glass, a bunch, of, a bunch of different analytic tools that looked at the competencies that um, are inherent in six of the fastest growing frontline healthcare positions. We pulled from that you know, specific data that said here are 50 competencies that cut across all these positions. We then ran 
thir partner, with partners, 13 focus groups throughout their system in hospitals, community centers, you know, gathering information and, and, and refining and refining um, what ultimately has turned out to be the curriculum. So it's much more about a partnership and much less, I think so often the university um, business partnership is almost like a vendor client thing or you know or come in once a year and check out our curriculum and we'll feed you lunch and go away um this is it's it's much more of a, it's a it's an ongoing partnership and as as the program evolves we're constantly looking for feedback and and getting it great oh, great point thank you i think there was a question over here or yeah sure so i'll, I'll take a stab at that um Another hat that I wear is as the director of the Problem-Based Learning Resource Center for NEBI. Um, and what we're doing is we're trying to address just that, is um, working with faculty on how do you develop and implement your curriculum around problem-based learning so that it's not just a project that I do once a semester, but that it's embedded in what uh, the teachers use every day in their classroom. So from an industry perspective, um, you look at the teacher now becoming the supervisor of learning, not the instructor, the all-knowing, I'm going to give you the knowledge that I have, but being really student-centered and looking at what is the content curriculum that I need to cover in this course and how do I match that with real-world experiences and things that are happening in industry around us to create some of those partnerships. And students love that. They walk away really enlightened and they feel empowered and engaged. And so, um, but it is risky for uh, teachers and faculty to understand how to do that. So that's one of the things that we're working on is helping teachers be able to implement those type of philosophies in their classroom. I think the career track isn't conducive to that at all. They were changing. No, it's it's not. So it, it's, it, it is definitely a pull because now you're asking tenured faculty in a lot of cases who have been teaching in a certain way for a very long time to change their teaching practice and it's very uncomfortable. So um, it, it's a process and hopefully we can make incremental changes that will lead to long-term changes. Yeah, we've been, this is kind of a holy grail for us to do what you're doing, which is to kind of flip the internship uh, on its head and bring that experience into the classroom. And for a very, at least one fundamental reason, it's very hard to scale internships. Companies have no, they are, they're not unlimited in terms of how many students they can bring in to, to have a really quality leader, uh, internship opportunity. Plus research opportunities, you know, you, you know, you think about some four-year institutions uh, where there's, they're not research intensive, they, they have a limited capacity to bring students into these research experiences. Our thought was let's tap our business partners and get them engaged with faculty in creating in-class research experiences similar to what University of Texas has done with the freshman research initiative but have it driven by business and since we're we're focused on data science as much as we are and that has very low laboratory requirements all you need is a laptop or a tablet uh, you could do experiments uh, or you could do uh, projects in the classroom now to your point about uh, faculty and their reticence to engage in this um, I might even call on Debbie to answer this because she's our in-house eCure person. But uh, the, the notion is to create a culture for um, maybe within one department. We sometimes have to search around to find the right part of an academic institution in which to conduct this. But we, we uh, actually developed a proposal. Uh, it was submitted to the Department of Education. It was not successful, but we got buy-in from five of our academic institutions to do exactly what you're doing. And they found the business partners. So we're just waiting to find the right moment to launch this. But uh, Debbie, is there anything uh, that, any wisdom around faculty preparedness, development that we need to be thinking about? I think the other thing too, like, um with the partnerships that EMA has developed in some of the programs, we're demanding it. We're saying, this is what we need from the faculty to teach these courses in this way. And, and that's been pretty successful as well. Hey, Kelly, I might not have you over at my institution. <laughs> <laughs> but I, 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 I do want to so say, funny. though, you know, we, we've done a lot of work with our faculty and I think the best thing that can be done is for folks to help show it's in the faculty's best interest, which is what we've done at UMass School. 
and invested a lot in faculty development, enabling them to take yeah. this kind of problem-based learning, the more interactive, you know, dealing with adult learners, which is much different. But I think at the end of the day, as you pointed out, there is some select self-selection like everything that we do. Some faculty are just much better at this. And you go, you go with your winners, and then you help try to pull others along. Because it's been our experience, the more that you can do that, the better they do in these situations, the better they are in their classroom day to day. So the faculty understand this is a win for them to become more relevant. That's the message to faculty. And when they hear that, I, our experience is that they very much buy in. So um, my demanding is, was, was a kidding. little strong. Um, <laughs> we highly encourage it. And we um, might try speak, bribing. As a uh, <laughs> speak to what our needs are. And it really is difficult to teach manufacturing from a textbook. So uh, it's, it's helpful in that, no. that area. That's great. How about one last question? From the audience. Yeah, in fact, that's that's something we're very interested in is, again, with the data science and analytics push, how to integrate that into a liberal arts curriculum. And we do have liberal arts members of our organization. And we had an interesting uh, roundtable last year in New York with maybe 20 leading liberal arts college presidents and provosts to talk about this very notion of, of how to get data science in with the help of business. And and uh, it that that's going to be an ongoing thing, but I think we're, we're talking with uh, the National Endowment for the Humanities about this. Um, the Mellon Foundation is very interested in this as well. So I, I think this will be uh, something we'll be working on over time. Uh, yeah, and one last word on that. We, we're not focused on the data scientist. We're focused on what we call the data-enabled student our graduate, or the cyber enabled, because this is what business is telling us they need. They need people with these skills who can handle a variety of different functions within their company. So um, there are the data scientists, but that's, we, we agree with you that this, this needs to be a broader push throughout the curriculum. That's a great story. I, I have a lot of work here, but yeah, it's a great story. Thank you for sharing it. So it's a great story. And I think you point out a lot in the question of risk. You know, I, we all work with faculty. They're like us. They want, they're brilliant. They take great pride in really knowing their subject matter and being great faculty. And then when you introduce something new, sometimes it is hard to cross over that line. So how you enable that is really important. And you gave a great example. And congratulations on that success. All right. Is that it? Anybody else from the panel? Well, again, thank you all for coming. Thanks for being part of this session. We really enjoyed it.